Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's Cesar Farfan here, Head of Retail Distribution for Perennial. Uh, welcome to uh, the live webinar, Invest Income Generator Fund. Uh, with me uh, is Stephen Bruce, the Portfolio Manager for the Shares for Income Trust. Just before I provide a uh, brief uh, overview and introduction to uh, eInvest, I'd just like to get a little bit of uh, housekeeping out of the way. Now, uh, we do have uh, quite a, a number of attendees today, so, so you've all been muted. Now, that doesn't mean you can't ask questions. We'd, we'd love to get questions from you. Uh, to do that, you'll see on, on the right-hand side of your screen, you have a navigation panel. You, you can open and close that with, uh, there's an orange uh, arrow there. Now, you can actually type in questions at any time. We'll make sure that we answer those questions appropriately either throughout the presentation or towards the end of the presentation. Keep in mind that you, to, after the, the, the webinar's conclusion, you will receive a copy of the presentation and also a recorded uh, recording of the presentation. So uh, you'll, you'll be able to share that with, with uh, either your colleagues in the office or, or some of your clients. Uh, so, so on that note, uh, I might just jump into the presentation and go to, um, yeah, uh, I'll quickly uh, skip through the, the mandatory disclaimer bit and uh, I'll just go into a, a brief overview. So um, I'll, I'll just touch on uh, the, the, the offering briefly. The offer is open now and then I'll pass on to Stephen Bruce to talk about the nuts and bolts of, of the strategy in the process. So E-Invest Income Generator is basically the listed version of the Perennial Valley Shares for Income Trust, which has been around for 12 years. Uh, it's all about income and it's all about providing regular and reliable income uh, in, in, a, in a monthly distribution uh, straight into your clients' accounts. Uh, the, the strategy itself uh, has not only um, had an income focus, but it's also provided, uh, uh, it's outperformed uh, the market on a total return basis and has never actually failed to, to pay a, a distribution. So unlike its unlisted version, what we're doing with, with e-invest uh, income generators, we're now providing in a listed format uh, via an exchange traded managed fund. So it'll, it'll look and feel and trade like a share, but basically in essence, it's a listed managed fund. Uh, through through IGA, uh, you'll be able to um, get access to a diversified uh, actively managed portfolio of quality dividend paying Australian shares. Unlike other ETFs uh, in the market, it's not a passive capability. So the strategy will be managed by the same team that manages the unlisted capability. And so it'll be an actively managed uh, uh, portfolio of, of Australian large to mid cap stocks. Uh, now we, we, we have had this strategy around for a while and what we've seen in the last few years is, is quite a growth or proliferation in number of, of equity for income strategies, both passive and active. What we can say about the, the, the e-invest income generator strategy is that it's fairly fairly straightforward. Um, as a value manager, we have a very disciplined bottom-up focus, a, a big focus on, on company balance sheet strength, uh, a big focus as well on, on cash flows and sustainable dividend yields. Uh, no complex derivative strategies or gearing. So, so really, we're, sort of, we're bringing it back to basics, and, and we think there's, there's a lot to be said about that. We've seen, as, as I mentioned briefly, proliferation in more complex strategies using, uh, I guess, dividend harvesting techniques more aggressively or, or also uh, derivative strategies to either provide protection or, or to enhance income in the, in, in the case of, say, protected calls. We have the, the ability to do that, but really it's, 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 it's a good old uh, Aussie imputation fund with a solid track record delivered to you, I guess, in a, in a contemporary structure. Uh, we also think uh, we're better placed uh, in this rising rate environment versus your typical equity income portfolio out there. So the good thing about our strategy is we've, we've, we've seen the good, the bad and the ugly, ha having launched a strategy pre-GFC, managed money throughout the GFC and post-GFC. Uh, we, we've seen the long end of, of, the, of, the, of the bond curve uh, kick up with this sort of synchronised global growth and we've seen the effect that that can have on some interest rate sensitive stocks. Uh, whether it be in the REIT sector or infrastructure, utilities or other bond proxies. So just briefly to the next slide and I'll touch on some of the, you know, the key benefits. So, so the invest income generator is, is all about providing a reliable, regular tax effective income stream paid monthly into the, into the bank accounts of your clients. 
the, the distribution that we target uh, or targeting at the moment is, is 7%, and that's made up of a 5% cash yield, the dividend, plus associated franking credits of 2%. So, so from a monthly perspective, what you should expect is you'll get 5% divided by 12. Uh, that'll be paid uh, sort of mid-month uh, after month end. And then at the end of the year, when your clients get their statements, they'll get the, 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 frank, the, the franking credits. Now, long term, we know that this strategy has also outperformed the market on a total return basis. So you should also expect capital growth and realise capital gains. So the underlying strategy, and Steve will talk about this, has its own track record and, and it's been in excess of 7%, but we're, we're being conservative with this being a new product. Uh, as I mentioned, it's not a passive strategy. Uh, we, we have a, it's an actively managed portfolio. Uh, and also offered to you in, in, in an efficient, low-cost listed structure. Look, ideally suited for, I say, anyone who's looking to, to derive some income, but obviously uh, better suited to those uh, income-seeking pension phase investors or, or retirees. Just a little bit on the structure. Uh, we've all seen uh, the exchange-traded product uh, market grow tremendously in the last few years. Most of the structures that have come to market have been close-ended listed investment com companies or listed investment trusts. This is a bit different. In essence, what it is, is it's either, you, know, you can call it a, a, a listed managed fund or, or an active ETF, but basically uh, it's, 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 it's an open-ended fund. It, it, it'll list uh, um, and, and then it'll remain open. So. Others have come before us, like Platinum and Magellan and Schroeder. So it's a structure that's not new. Um, it, it's it's uh, it's well understood, and uh, and uh, we think it provides benefits to to um, investors over above licks and licks. As we know, they're good structures, but they have some some pitfalls. You're not going to have an issue of trading at a discount or a premium. So obviously, if you're an existing investor, you don't want to see your LIC or your investment trading at a discount. Equally, if you're, if you're looking at a new investment and you want to get in, you don't necessarily want to be paying a premium for it. Uh, I guess a lot to be said about transparency as well. So what we've learned from our passive ETFs on the market is that transparency, transparency is becoming uh, more, more the norm these days. Uh, with, with, uh, with this product, you'll also uh, will be opening up the portfolio one month in arrears. So your clients will be able to see exactly what underlying holdings they have. Uh, There'll also be no setup costs. So no setup costs borne by you or, or the trust or your clients. All those costs will be borne by us, the manager. So it'll 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 issue at four dollars and it'll be trading at four dollars from day one, or it'll be trading at NTA or NAV from day one. Uh, we're also offering a very competitive uh, pricing structure at um, basically eighty basis points all up. That's a sixty face sixty five basis point management fee and expenses capped at 50 basis points, uh, no performance fee. This is actually cheaper than our unlisted structure, which is at 92 basis points uh, and, and capped, as I mentioned. So there'll be no, no other costs. And uh, once again, you're getting access there to, to an active manager. So on that note, I'll, uh, I'll pass on to, to Stephen Bruce, who will talk more about the portfolio. Uh, thank you, Caesar, and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and thanks very much for your time today. So, as Caesar said, this product is all about generating an attractive level of income for your for your clients, and we know that demand for income is there increasingly as more and more people move into retirement. But we also know that it's very difficult to meet that need in the current low interest rate environment. So if we just have a look through the options available, you can start with term deposits at the lowest end of the risk spectrum. Make sure they keep your principal safe, but at 2.3% or thereabouts, they're barely keeping up with inflation. If you think about government bonds, a 10-year government bond is yielding around 2.7%. Again, barely better than inflation, and you have the significant risk that you're going to lose some of your capital as interest rates and bond yields start to tick up. That moves us in along to bank hybrids, Bank hybrid is around 5% yield, including franking credits. That's looking more attractive. But what we do know about hybrids, which have been very popular in recent years, is that they do have some equity-like risks. Now, the day that Commonwealth Bank runs into trouble, bank hybrids are going to start performing like Commonwealth Bank shares. So that leads us along to um, e-invest income generator. Now, this is a portfolio which aims to generate an attractive 
level of pre-tax income of 7% per annum from a diversified portfolio of dividend paying Australian shares. And what you can see is it's a far more attractive level of income than is available by or from other alternatives. But of course, what we know is it's not really just about what the current level of income yield is. There are other factors that are very important too. And one of the most important of these is whether or not an income stream grows over time. Now, the problem with fixed income investments is they don't generate a growing income stream, whereas a quality company will grow its earnings over time and that will lead to growing earnings per share and growing dividends per share. And that growth in dividend income is very important in offsetting the effects of inflation and preserving your purchasing power of your income stream. And of course, we all know that the equities market provides you with capital growth over the long term as well. So it's that growing income stream and the long term capital growth, as well as the more attractive current level of income, which is what makes investing in quality Australian shares such a good way to generate income for your investors. Now, on top of that, our structure provides you with monthly income. Um, monthly income because we're paying in equal monthly instalments. That's something that's going to be uh, very valuable to investors, that predictability and reliability of the income stream. And being available in the exchange traded managed fund structure gives you that liquidity and convenience. You can click to buy and click to sell your units in the, in the, in the, um, in the fund. And they always trade at net asset value, unlike a live. So at a very attractive level of income and many other attractive features as well. So a little bit about our firm, Perennial Value, we're a specialist Australian equities manager. We were founded in 2000 by John Murray, who's a veteran of the industry. We're a substantial firm with over $5 billion under management across multiple capabilities. As a result of that, we're very well resourced. We've got strong internal legal and compliance and back office infrastructure. And being a boutique, we're majority employee owned. That brings an alignment of interest and importantly, large, uh, very low uh, staff turnover. So we're a large investment team of 15 people with over 200 years collective experience. When we think about our investment process, at the core of what we do is extensive financial, mo financial modelling, where we're running detailed models on over 200 stocks at any point in time. And importantly, we have a proven long-term track record. We've been managing Australian share funds for 18 years now and our income-oriented fund for 12 years since 2005. Just looking at our investment team in a little more detail, you can see John Murray, the founder and managing director on the left, myself, the lead portfolio of this fund. I've been with the firm since um, since the beginning as well. And the deputy portfolio manager is Damien Cotty, another long serving member of our, of our team with 14 years with our fund. The rest of the team are listed below and you can see collectively over 200 years experience and over 100 years collective tenure with our firm. Moving on to our investment process, it's the underlying stock selection process is a fundamental driven bottom up value style investment process. And what that really means in simplest terms is we're trying to buy quality businesses which can grow their earnings and dividends over time and have a track record of profitability. Being a value style fund, we're always looking for our portfolio to offer good value and trade at a discount to the market on the key valuation metrics we look at. And at the core of our process is a very strong focus on balance sheet strength. And for example, we have a minimum net interest cover of three times of any stock we hold in the portfolio. And the, per the reason for that is while balance sheet strength is always critical, it's especially important when it comes to investing for income, whereas a strong balance sheet is a foundation that underpins the ability to pay dividends. So the sort of stocks that we're selecting for this portfolio are the same sort of stocks that we would select for our mainstream Australian equities portfolio, being stocks where we like the fundamentals and we like the valuation, then out of that pool of stocks, we construct this portfolio by tilting towards those stocks which have higher dividend yields. For example, we'll, we have a rule that all stocks, stocks must have a pre-tax dividend yield of at least 4% for inclusion in this portfolio. We'll also increase the weights ahead of certain stocks, ahead of dividend paying periods, and we'll participate in off-market buybacks, which are a very tax efficient way of collecting franking credits. Delving a little bit deeper into the investment process, I've talked about this focus on fundamentals and it's very important. This isn't a quant-based strategy. It isn't just chasing 
chasing yield around the markets, investing in quality stocks where we like the fundamentals, we like the valuation, all underpinned, as I said, by some deep financial analysis performed by our large investment team, number one focus on balance sheet strength, and then what we call true cash yields. And by that we mean we'll only invest in companies where the dividend is being paid out of genuine operating cash flow. And that avoids getting involved in any company where there's any degree of financial engineering, because if there's one thing history has shown, that's financial engineering, principally paying distributions out of debt always ends badly. And as I said, we've got a proven process with a 12 year track record. And I think that's quite relevant because there've been many income funds which has popped up in the last five years or so and have only seen one type of market condition. So in a way, we think, we think our fund is significantly differentiated to many other income funds on the market at the moment. In terms of portfolio construction and risk limits, again, this is this is very straightforward. We have 30 to 40 stocks in the portfolio. We go down to a minimum market cap of $500 million, which gives us a universe of around 150 stocks. We have a maximum cash limit of 20%, although in reality, we aim to be fully invested at all times, which means having a cash level of less than 5%. And in terms of stock and sector limits, we have a stock limit of plus or minus 5% versus the index and sector limits of plus or minus 20%, with the fund being represented in between seven and eight sectors of the market at any given time, typically. And it's very important maintaining this diversification as we don't want to bet the portfolio on any particular stock theme or sector. And again, in terms of the simplicity of this product, there's no gearing and there's no derivatives. We want to keep this very simple, reliable and no surprises. So how does this translate in reality into the sort of stocks that we buy and don't buy? I think a very good example and something which also reinforces the importance of a long track record is if we cast our mind back to the case of the REITs back before the GFC. If you can remember back in those days, back before 2007, the REITs were the go-to sector in the market for retail investors looking for reliable, safe sleep at night income. And they had been that for a very long time. However, as we moved through the 2000s, these, these sort of companies had really changed their spots. Looking under the bonnet, you can see they'd become very expensive. Their balance sheets had become very highly levered and they were paying unsustainably high distributions out of debt. And so our analysis said that this was effectively an accident waiting to happen. And of course, the moment the credit market seized up, this sector um, was absolutely decimated. And we're pleased to be able to say our, our basic investment disciplines meant that we didn't not hold a single REIT in 2007 and it therefore protected our investors' capital. And the really telling thing here when you look at the blue and the red lines is during a sell-off, when your balance sheet is okay, you recover. When your balance sheet is not okay, you have permanent loss of capital. So where do we think there are concerns in the, or risks in the market today? Well, I guess the good news is to us, it doesn't seem that there's anything significant in the market that looks anything like REITs did back in 2007. However, one area where we do see what we think is some emerging risks, and it's also an area where we think there's a lot of investor concentration, particularly amongst yield seeking investors, is around what are known as the bond proxies. And these are, these are the sort of stocks which have been very popular in recent years which have benefited from falling interest rates and a perceived defensiveness. And I'm thinking here about stocks like the infrastructure stocks, for example, Transurban and Sydney Airport. But what happens when interest rates start to rise? Now, we had a bit of a taste of this back in 2000, back in the second half of 2016, where bond yields took their first step up from 2% to 2.8%. What we saw was this whole sector of the market sold off around 20 to 25%. And if you contrast that to the sort of stocks that we hold in our portfolio on the right hand side, a more broadly diversified industrials, financials and resources, you saw a significant degree of outperformance from the sort of stocks that we hold. And I think this has given us a bit of a taste of what we might see going over the next couple of years as the interest rate cycle starts to normalise. Taking that analysis a little bit further, on slide 15, what we've done is just to highlight how our fund is not exposed to this risk. On the right hand side, we've shown the breakup of our fund 
between the interest rate sec sensitive sectors and the non-interest rate sensitive sectors. And you can see that we've got less than 10% of our portfolio exposed to this risk of rising interest rates. If we contrast this to what we're calling the typical model portfolio, which is borrowed from a large retail broking firm, which is this is how they allocate their clients' money in their income portfolios, you can see that other fund had over 40% of its portfolio value exposed to these sectors which are which are at significant risk in a rising interest rate environment. So what that means is if you're invested in a fund which is structured like the one on the left, or alternatively you have clients with direct holdings which is looking similar to what you see on the left, then by moving some money into a fund like ours, in one, in one easy movement, you can diversify away that exposure to rate risk quite effectively by adding around 30 stocks which are, um, which are quite complementary. So we've talked about the examples of stocks we haven't held in the past. We've talked about the risks that we see in the market at the moment. So what sort of stocks do we look for? If we use as a case study a stock called Event Hospitality, this is this is a, a company that's not very well known, despite the fact that it has a two billion dollar market cap. They own brands that you can see, such as uh, Event Cinemas, Atura, and Ridges and QT Hotels, and operate the Threadbow Ski Resort. Now, this is our type of stock. It's got a conservative management team, a very strong balance sheet, and it tends to deliver year in year out. And if we look at some of the financial metrics on the right hand side there. You've got an attractive gross dividend yield of 5%, but importantly, that's underpinned by a conservative payout ratio of 65%, and it's all sitting on top of a very strong balance sheet with low gearing of 17%, 17 times interest cover. And then further, on the basis of our analysis, if we look at its valuation compared to other similar companies that operate similar businesses, we think it's around one third undervalued. So this is the sort of company that we're looking to put into your portfolio. If we take the analysis a little bit further, what we can see is if you invested $10,000 into event hospitality shares a decade ago or into term deposits, what we can see is you've had a dramatically better outcome in terms of the dividend generated over time from your event hospitality shares. So over that period, you've had this steady increase in the dividends paid, assisted along by some special dividends when they've had a bit extra, whereas your term deposit income has just gone backwards over that time. And to put a few more numbers around that, if we look here, what we can see is a 12 month term deposit over the last decade would have given you a bit over four and a half thousand dollars in income, no capital growth. So a total outcome of fourteen and a half thousand dollars. Your event hospitality shares have given you nearly ten thousand dollars in income, have doubled in share price and given you over thirty one thousand dollars in total return at the end. So you can just see the dramatic the dramatically better outcome that you can get from a portfolio of quality stocks over a longer time period. And there, I guess one really interesting way of looking at this as well is if we look in the right hand column and think about it in purely income terms. So what we're showing here is what the income generated in the last 12, most recent 12 months was as a percentage of that $10,000 you invested all those 10 years ago. So you can see your term deposit investment has only generated less than two and a half percent even after all these years, whereas your investment in event hospitality has given you a 12% income yield on that initial investment. And it really starkly highlights how much better you can do from an income perspective from quality stocks over time. In terms of the diversification of holdings, here's just an example of some of the, the range of stocks we hold in our portfolio. The only one I'll make mention of really is BHP, which again is a bit of um, a bit of a differentiator from many other income funds which probably don't hold resources. And in fact, in our income fund, we've not had resources for most of its life. However, we are in a period in our view now where the, the resource companies are going to continue to generate strong cash flows, rapidly de-gear their balance sheets and continue to pay attractive dividends to investors. And we saw in the last result, Rio lifted its dividend 70%, BHP lifted its dividend 38%, Rio's already done an off-market buyback and BHP could well do one after they, if they sell their, their US shale business. So again, a bit of a differentiator there. In terms of the track record, we've been running the underlying trust for 12 years now. 
Um, the objective has always been to deliver a higher level of pre-tax income after fees in the overall market. And you can see our distribution income return has been 8% per annum over that period compared to 6.1% for the overall market. So nearly 2% of extra income. And we've always had the objective of delivering total return outperformance as well. And you can see that over the 12 years, there's been some modest total return outperformance as well on an after fee basis. In terms of our research house ratings, the underlying trust is re rated recommended by both LONSEC and Zenith. This listed version is rated recommended by LONSEC and recommended plus by IIR. Now, we don't have a Zenith rating because Zenith don't actually rate um, ETMFs. So those we only have the, the two ratings you can see here, but importantly, the underlying trust is recommended by Zenith as well. So in summary, we think what we've got here is, is a fund which really meets that need for a growing tax effective income stream. We think the regular reliable monthly income payments is something that investors are going to value. It's all sitting on an investment process which has been proven over the long term and is underpinned by a focus on true cash yields. And it's being delivered by an efficient, low cost ETMF structure that solves many of the issues around LICs and is more convenient than an unlisted trust. So we think this is something which can really form an ideal uh, component of an income generating portfolio. So thank you for, for, for your interest and I'll pass back to Caesar now. Thank you, Steve. Um, thanks very much for, for the presentation. Uh, just mindful of time, uh, we've got a few minutes to wrap up. Um, I'll just summarise with the offer and then we've got some questions, so we'll take those. In terms of the offer, as I mentioned, it's will and truly open. It's open until the 27th of April. Uh, we have two offers. We have a broker firm offer and a general offer. So the general offer basically means that you can apply for units in, in uh, e-invest through our website. Uh, the broker offer is open to any broker in town. Uh, so for those of you that have a relationship with your broker, please go ahead. Uh, we have a number of brokers that are working on the offer with us. So Board, Board Manette, Bells, Macquarie, Bailey, Morgan Stanley, CBA. Uh, we've also had interest from other brokers like CCZ and Wilson's. So f feel free to, um, to to approach us if, if you don't have a preferred broker. Uh, the the offer is paying a 1.5% placement fee. As I mentioned before, this is uh, fully funded by us. So this is not coming out of the, the trust itself. Um, and as I mentioned before as well, you'll receive a, a copy of the presentation and, and a recording as well. So in the interest of time, we might just go over to the questions now. Uh, I have a question here uh, for Stephen that says, last time that investors were buying resources for income, and signify the top of the resources cycle. What is different this time? Oh, thank you. That that is a very a very good question and something that we, we think about a lot. I think what we what's different this time to use that terrible that terrible phrase is that we're now at a far more subdued period of the cycle where there's no froth, there's no frenzy production expansion has stopped. There's very little new capacity come on. In fact, capacity is being taken out of the market. Demand is not off the charts, but it is solid. So I think we have, we're at a far more sustainable point in the cycle. And when we think about the behaviour of the resource companies as well, they're all, they're all doing the opposite of what they were doing at the peak of the last cycle, that they're, not do, they're no longer investing. They're focused on cost. They're focused on de-gearing their balance sheet. They're selling out assets rather than buying assets. Now, this won't last forever, but I think we're into a period uh, and there'll be a reasonably long period where where they continue to generate good returns and income distributions. Thanks, Steve. Uh, we actually have another question here. Uh, what makes this fund different to other equity income funds? So I think uh, of, we talked through a number of the factors in the presentation. I think number one is the structure, this listed ETMF structure we think is really a great structure for a fund to be in. But at the underlying portfolio level, the portfolio holdings, and I guess this is getting back to the previous question about resources, are quite different to what we think many of the other income funds in the market are holding. And in particular, that lack of exposure that we have 
to the rate sensitive sectors of the market, which we think are at particular, at particular risk of being sold off as the uh, interest rate cycle starts to turn after this long, long period of very low interest rates and QE, et cetera. We have another question, Steve. Do you hold Telstra in the portfolio? And if not, why not? Dividend yield is very attractive. We do have some Telstra. It is not a large position in the portfolio. We, in fact, we, we reduced it significantly oh, probably a year and a half ago at, at significantly higher prices than it's trading at now. It's one where you really need to balance up that attractive dividend yield that it does have versus the fact that it is going to be very difficult for that company to generate a lot of um, earnings growth over the next over the next couple of years. So one of the critical things with an income fund is getting that balance between a high level of dividend income, but having some decent capital growth as well. And that comes down to making sure that you're buying stocks, which in aggregate are going to give you some reasonable level of earnings growth, not just paying out a high, a high level of dividend. Just had another question come through. So you don't use complex derivatives, but you retain the capability of using strategies like selling calls against some of your holdings. Please confirm. Yeah, that's right. We do actually have the uh, the ability to do that. It is something that has never been done in 12 years. Generally, as a as a um, starting point, we don't think that that's necessary. Um, in fact, we think that selling calls, which many, many funds do, often in a very systematic fashion, we think it generally is selling away too much of your upside. And we think around 7% yield is attractive enough and you can achieve that without without selling calls. So we do have the capability to do it. We have the in-house skills, but it's not something that we would, we would really consider under, under normal circumstances. Another question has come through, Steve. Uh, are distributions only paid from fund income or is there a component of realised capital gains? Yeah. So the structure underlying the ETMF is a, is a trust and as a result of that, it's required to pay out all of its gains in the year that they're realised. So that means that when you do have net realised capital gains for a period, they do have to be paid out and that will be done with the final distribution at the end of the financial year. Um, if we look back over time, um, there's been around 10% um, of the total distribution has come as a result of realised capital gains from the trust with the remainder being from income. And uh, Steve, another question has come through. Uh, we've seen a growth in, in uh, income seeking passive ETFs. Why, why should we recommend uh, an active income ETF to our clients? Uh, thanks for that question. And that's a really topical one in the sense that, um, yeah, we all know there is this, there's the growing, growing use of passive strategies. But I think there, there's a real risk with um, a, a passive income strategy in that it depends on the rules to which they've been put together. For example, many of them are, I guess, quite simplistic and just pick stocks with the highest dividend yield. Whereas I think we're, we're of the view that there's a lot more involved in simply constructing a portfolio of stocks with a high yield. You need to have that fundamental analysis as well and not just be effectively chasing yield because there's no point buying some, a stock with a high yield whose earnings are only ever going to go backwards or is about to run into a significant profit downgrade or has a balance sheet that's stretched and it means that their dividend is going to be, going to be cut. So I'd say investing in a high yield index strategy is a lot riskier than say a high yield general market strategy. Another question, Steve. Uh, could you explain the ration, the rational, uh, or the rationale behind uh, having uh, Woodside in the portfolio? Yeah, we we like Woodside for two reasons. Firstly, we're positive on the outlook for the oil price, and and with it, the the natural gas price um, or LNG price. And Woodside obviously is very highly leveraged to that. We like the lot the medium term production growth outlook for Woodside. It's got a number of um, significant growth initiatives there. So we think, and we like the management, we think they've done a good conservative management team. So it really, it ticks all the boxes. Uh, balance sheet's good, outlook's good, management's good, and it can pay an attractive level of dividend. And uh, I think we've got time for probably one more question that's just come through. Uh, Stephen, you mentioned that 
uh, the interest rate cycle is normalising and we notice that you're, uh, I guess, underweight some of the interest rate sensitive stocks. Uh, can you please elaborate? That's right. So just just to just to to um, address that again, one of the key reasons we're different in our portfolio is that we are we are underweight those parts of the market which are sensitive to any increase in interest rates. We think and we think that's a key differentiator. And we what in particular around the infrastructure stocks, the utilities, anything with a or anything with a high level of debt. That's that's the sort of stocks that we avoid. And we try and give people more broadly diversified industrials and financials and resources exposure, which we think is going to perform better in the environment that we're going to see going forward where globally growth is improving, rates are starting to normalise and basically where the world is getting back to normal. Well, thank you very much, Stephen. It's Caesar here again. On that note, uh, we'll just wrap up. And uh, j just to quickly summarise, so, so the E-Invest Income Generator Fund is, is, a, is a listed uh, vehicle that will provide you with a regular, reliable, tax-effective income paid monthly into your client's account. It has a 12-year track record. Um, it, it'll, it'll be uh, offered through, through this uh, initial offer up until the end of April. But uh, once it lists, it'll, it'll continue to, to grow just like any other open-ended uh, ETMF structure. So uh, thank you very much, and uh, we appreciate you joining our, our live webinar. Have a, have a great day.